The topic that I was uh, given, and thank you for the invitation uh, to the organizers of the meeting, uh, was the uh, choosing the best treatment options for low-risk breast cancer, which, uh, uh, you know, so several years ago was simply uh, standard whole breast six weeks of radiation or mastectomy, and, and now we have mother, uh, a, a number of other um, uh, options. And so I'll talk about a conventional whole breast, uh, accelerated whole breast, accelerated partial breast, and finally, elimination of radiation, all of which I think are reasonable options uh, in this situation. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. So by way of background, uh, we all know that conventional fractionated whole breast radiation over the course of five to six weeks is, is widely embraced as an accepted standard of care. We have excellent long-term follow-up on an efficacy, toxicity, showing its equivalence to a mastectomy for early stage of breast cancer. Uh, we also know that, uh, and this is from the Darby uh, 2011 uh, meta-analysis of all the randomized trials, that not only does conventional whole breast radiation improve um, a local control as shown on, on um, your uh, left side, uh, but um, also uh, improves uh, overall mortality. And, and so one of the issues that we face when looking at other options, whether it's partial breast, or, um, or um, elimination of radiation is, well, why should we um, compromise that we clearly have improved local control and even impact on, on mortality, and we shouldn't really um, uh, uh, deviate from that practice. And, and while that is clearly true that overall, um, I think I'll demonstrate to you a little later that certainly for low-risk disease, while we likely also with radiation impact on local control, it's unlikely with low risk disease that we would impact on mortality. And I'll show you some of that data. But of course, the limitations of conventional whole breast radiation over the course of six weeks uh, is that it's a long overall treatment time, patient convenience costs. Uh, we've heard the argument of limited access, which is why originally some of the work in brachytherapy um, and partial breast developed. And the other question, is it necessary to treat the whole breast? Why can't we just treat the area at highest risk? And so uh, in response to that, we have a number of emerging strategies, which we'll talk to you about, which are conventional, uh, I'm sorry, hypofractionated whole breast radiation, accelerated partial breast radiation by a number of techniques, intraoperative radiation, again, partial breast radiation, and which, which by a different approach, and of course, elimination of radiation. And we all know that with conventional whole breast or even hypofractionated whole breast, the target, of course, is the entire breast tissue, where with partial breast techniques, the target is typically the tumor bed and a surrounding rim of tissue where the highest risk of local recurrence uh, happens to be, at least according to the um, number of studies that we've done over the years. And also in response to these emerging technologies, um, Astro has come up with uh, two consensus statements, uh, one on the accelerated partial breast, which now is is uh, over five years old and actually due for an update. And, and I believe uh, there will be a, uh, a panel, a panel has been formed uh, to uh, update the consensus on partial breast radiation. And of course, uh, there was an, in 2011, a panel on, um, on hypofractionated whole breast radiation. So let's talk about hypofractionated whole breast, which I think is emerging as a very acceptable standard of care for the majority of women with breast cancer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that is based on a number of trials, but what, the first trial which made the biggest splash in this was in, published in New England Journal uh, from, the, um, from the group from Canada, uh, Tim Whalen and company, who really showed that uh, comparing uh, five weeks of radiation uh, to, to their uh, uh, basically three-week course, um, that uh, there was equivalent local control uh, and um, equivalent uh, local control not only uh, overall, but really among all subgroups. Uh, the one um, area that there was some question on was uh, this group here where, where high-grade tumors seem to do better with conventional um, six, five-week course of radiation. This was probably a spurious result, as I'll show you in a minute. But certainly overall, hypofractionated whole breast 
this looked pretty good. And this, of course, was complemented more recently uh, in the update of the UK START trial. And the UK START trial was a little bit confusing um, <clears throat> because there was a three week, you know, five week, um, there was one, it was all 50 infractions, but one was over three weeks, one was over five weeks. But I'll focus on the three week one, which was the more practical and, uh, and uh, practice changing uh, trial. And um, <clears throat> in, in the, I think this, along with the Canadian uh, results kind of reassured us that, in fact, three weeks of, of whole breast radiation is equivalent to, to the standard. And, um, and again, this trial uh, randomized patients to um, whole breast, um, and, and, and I'll focus on trial B here, which, which randomized patients to whole breast 50 gray in, in five weeks uh, versus uh, the 40 gray in, in three weeks. And, um, <clears throat> and a boost was allowed in both of these trials, but it was optional at the discretion of the physician. And baseline characteristics, of course, we see a um, um, typical breast cancer age group of median age of 57. They did have younger patients, but the median age of 57, of course, majority of these patients were, were early stage. Um, and um, and uh, the, they showed, in fact, the same thing. If anything, the hypofractionated uh, course did a little bit uh, better. But this was um, with respect to um, the one thing that we worry about is um, any effect in cosmesis when we go a little faster in logic fraction sizes. And you can see here that the, um, that, um, the, the cosmesis was, was as good, if not better. Um, and again, here, shown here by a number of factors, looking at the uh, change in photographic appearance, uh, the uh, breast, uh, you know, uh, in duration, et cetera. Uh, certainly, the 40 gray in three weeks was no worse, may have been even a little bit better. And uh, local regional control, of course, also was at least as good, as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the um, 40 gray uh, doing uh, with local regional control doing at least as well as the 50 gray, if not even a little bit better. So this in combination with the Canadian trial certainly reassures us that three weeks of whole breast radiation um, could be um, an acceptable, is an acceptable standard of care. <clears throat> the one thing that people might have uh, an issue about was the high grade. Well, it turns out in the START trial, the UK START trial, they didn't see any grade effect when they looked at it. Uh, the, the high grades were doing just as well, again, if not better, with the, with the hypofractionation uh, approach. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, but the, uh, the uh, Canadian trial did have that result, which was somewhat questionable, uh, but uh, more recently they did uh, publish an update where they pulled at least the blocks of those patients that they that they could uh, from the, from that trial. Uh, they did a number of uh, of uh, studies looking at not only grade but some other uh, molecular factors, and it turns out that in fact none of those uh, turned out to be significant when they looked when they relooked at this uh, with this um, more detailed look. So. So I think um, you know the issue of grade. I don't think is an issue, and um, uh, any patient, whether they're low grade, high grade, um, hypofractionation is is a reasonable approach. Now, <clears throat> the one issue with all of those trials is that the majority of patients uh, were treated were over age 50, were pathological stage T1, T2. Chemotherapy was not typically used. Most of those trials did require some kind of uh, acceptable homogeneity within the breast. Um, and so <clears throat> the group of patients in whom hypofractionation is the strongest are certainly those T1, no chemotherapy, over age 50. Um, having said that, that does not, the, the patients in these other groups were in those trials. And so the um, and the astro consensus statement came out on that. It was, it was not that hypofractionation is wrong in patients under 50. I certainly do it for fairly frequently in patients under 50. Uh, it's not wrong in patients who, who have had chemotherapy. I use it in patients who've had chemotherapy. It's just that the majority of patients in those trials fit these criteria. And so you just need to decide for yourself what you feel comfortable with. Um, but 
but this is where the group uh, that uh, is uh, the, the, uh, ne the um, indications are certainly um, the strongest in because the majority of patients in the trials uh, had these characteristics. Now, <clears throat> the other issue, of course, is what about the regional lymph nodes? And I think many of us feel uncomfortable treating the regional lymph nodes on the three-week course until there's more data available. Having said that, however, if you lived in the United Kingdom and you needed your um, regional lymph nodes treated, you would be treated 40 gray in 15 fractions. Um, that's their standard of care. Uh, there were patients on the START trial who did have their regional lymphatics treated with 40 gray in 15, and <clears throat> it's probably quite safe. It's just that we haven't done that in a, in a uh, rigorous way over the many years and don't have a lot of data. So, so uh, most of us, when we're treating the lymph nodes, still move to a con more conventional fractionation course. But we're talking about low-risk disease here, so we're really talking about node-negative patients. So I think in hypofractionated whole breast, it's a very acceptable standard of care. I probably use it in the vast majority of patients. Um, <clears throat> there's some controversy regarding those patients who require a boost, younger patients, and who have received chemotherapy. But I don't want you to leave you with the thought that those patients are it's unacceptable. It is acceptable. It's just what your comfortable, comfort level is and what the patient's comfort, comfort level is. I have two patients ex identical. I had the same conversation with them, both in their 40s. One is undergoing hypofractionated. The other is going, undergoing conventional. After a conversation with the patient, patients felt, well, you know, I'd rather go with the one that's been around a longer time and whatever. So, so it's really a, an individualized decision. Um, but certainly with our improvements in technology, um, the field within field techniques that we have to have good homogeneity, even large breasted women can be treated. Uh, and, um, uh, but we must also recognize that the long term follow up and patient experience is more mature uh, in the um, in the um, conventional treatment. So moving on from partial breast irradiation, we have, of course, I mean, from hypofractionated whole breast radiation, we have a partial breast radiation, which is also done in a shorter period of time. And the rationale, of course, is the majority of recurrences occur at the initial site. Why do we need to treat the whole breast? And phase one, two data, and even now some phase three data uh, appears to be promising. Uh, the potential advantages, of course, is all local therapies completed prior to chemo, and um, then they can move on to the systemic treatment, and the treatment at the highest risk is what gets the <clears throat> dose of radiation. The potential dif disadvantages, of course, are that the local relapses may, in fact, be higher. Uh, we have some concerns about the large fraction sizes and whether that will impact on fibrosis and cosmesis in the long term. And most importantly, long-term prospective trials comparing partial breast to whole breast are lacking, but they're coming our way. Um, now, there are a number of approaches that you can use, and I'm sure you're all familiar with many, many of these. Um, the multi-catheter interstitial has been around a long time, but it's probably the less user-friendly uh, type. Uh, single catheter balloon based is, is certainly uh, caught on and, and it's probably um, in many ways uh, pretty widely used. External beam is pretty widely used, certainly on the NSABP trial. It's the most commonly used approach. And of course, intraoperative, which is uh, gaining a lot of traction um, in Europe, certainly, and, and gaining traction in the, in the States as well. The multi-catheter interstitial, of course, is, as you can see here, uh, is uh, the, the most invasive, um, the most um, um, requires probably the most user experience for to, for uh, doing doing it uh, properly and and with comfort, and uh, because of its more or less user unfriendliness, hasn't really uh, caught on in a big way. But it is quite useful in the sense that um, you you can certainly. Um, uh, design the uh, the catheter placement to fit the situation. Uh, you get a good dose. You can sculpture the dose as you need to, um, and um, and it and it works. And it's been around longer. Um, the balloon uh, based, uh, of course, is, has been uh, you know became very popular after the uh, FDA approved the mammocyte device in 2002, and really um, is. Uh, 
very user friendly. Surgeons seem to like this approach a lot, uh, and um, and it's caught on. Uh, certainly, uh, is used um, uh, and is is quite effective. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the balloon based approach has, of course, been. Um, uh, kept up with the times with multi lumen and catheters, different slight approaches, but but all b based basically on a single catheter replacement where one can sculpt the dose <coughs> uh, and uh, and give you um, a, a good uh, dose to a, a, uh, the uh, ca cavity around the tumor. Now the interstitial brachytherapy, just to give you, you know, one of the key studies was the Beaumont experience, 199 patients, where they reported uh, several years ago and have updated it from time to time, but um, a very good uh, uh, in-breast recurrence rate of 3.8% and good cosmesis in these patients. But again, this is a technique that really has to be in the right hands, um, somebody with good experience and, and, um, and uh, technical skills. The limitations, of course, are that it's invasive, so it's not terribly user-friendly from a patient perspective. Uh, there's a risk of infec infection. It is very operator dependent, uh, and it has limited penetrance in the in the radiation oncology community. Certainly, um, the um, balloon-based, of course, is uh, much more common than interstitial. Um, standard interstitial now, multi-catheter interstitial. It, it is also an interstitial technique. Uh, the mammocyte registry is, of course, one of the largest um, uh, databases that's looked at this. It, it continues to get updated from time to time. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the um, uh, over a thousand patients, um, most of them stage one, excellent cosmetic outcome. Uh, excellent five-year control rate. There's some evidence that perhaps ER-negative patients had higher local recurrence rates, in, at least in one of their studies. The limitations, of course, is that it's also invasive. There's the risk of uh, infection. There's uh, relatively short follow-up. And uh, it can be, not be appropriate for certain tumors of close to the chest wall, or certainly close to the skin. And <clears throat> so sometimes it has to be abandoned because of its location. External beam, uh, there's a number of studies, but the first key study was uh, that this published by Frank Ficini back in oh, um, um, several years ago, um, where um, they reported a pretty good but short follow-up uh, local recurrence rate and acceptable uh, outcomes. The limitations, of course, were fo short follow-up, uh, uncertainty in target delineation. It's not as, as clear as uh, uh, particularly if the patients, uh, if you can't clearly see the the um, the um, lumpectomy site uh, on CT scan, there's perhaps some uncertainty in day-to-day -day setup, and <clears throat> most importantly, there's a much larger dose to the um, to the breast uh, to the to the um, integral dose to the breast. Now, that's an disadvantage in in the sense that you get a, a, a larger volume being irradiated, but it could be an advantage too because you get obviously more of a margin around the tumor. So, uh, but there is a definitely an increased dose to the breast and there may be some issues in cosmesis, which I'll show you briefly. There have been a number of randomized trials that are ongoing. I won't go through all of these, uh, that, but <clears throat> the, the key one, of course, that we're all waiting uh, eagerly for the results um, to, to mature in a few years is uh, NSABP39 or RTOG0413, which randomized patients to whole breast or partial breast. And, <clears throat> and one was given the choice of doing partial breast by external beam or, break, or um, balloon or interstitial. And um, most of those patients in that trial, I believe, were getting external beam um, as it's much more widely available, but, uh, but a sizable amount also got um, the uh, balloon-based and there were a few interstitials. Um, so we're wait, awaiting the results of that trial. Um, but we do have uh, some results available um, showing, uh, now the Christie Hospital experience showed inferior results with partial breast, but there was some question about selection of patients in relatively small numbers. Uh, the, um, in, in the uh, NCI of Hungary trial, a little bit more mature, uh, and I'll show you now the 10-year the, the, uh, data on that. Uh, they have a median follow-up of 10 years, but it's only 258 patients, so it's really not a large population to, to test this in. But nonetheless, uh, they do show um, 
acceptable uh, in breast recurrence rates and um, at 10 years of follow-up. So um, at least in this small study, there's a randomized trial that shows an equivalence. Um, <clears throat> now, there had been some reports of toxicity with the external beam. Uh, we don't know whether this is due to um, just by chance, a relatively small retrospective series um, from both Michigan and Tufts that showed a question when one gave external beam a partial breast at 385 twice a day that they had some suboptimal cosmetic results. Um, we sh I would note, however, that whether whether those toxicities are, are just uh, unusual uh, and uh, example or whether they're real, um, we have to wait further uh, outcome from, from certainly the large NSABP trial. However, the RAPID trial did show some issues and, and that was, uh, again, the Canadian trial given um, randomization of 3D conformal external beam versus whole breast. And um, this was, they haven't reported their outcomes yet um, in terms of uh, local regional control, but they did report on cosmesis. Uh, and so they had, again, uh, over 2,000 patients randomized to whole breast or partial breast. And um, they gave the 3.85 twice a day uh, with all external beam. And they had cosmesis ex uh, assessed by um, a nurse and, and the patient, as well as a, a panel of a radiation oncologists. And uh, they reported a, a couple of years ago now, uh, based on an interim analysis, um, a poor um, cosmetic result in the partial breast. And <clears throat> this was, um, again, a uh, three independent measures. They looked at whole breast versus uh, partial breast. Uh, and the ad, what they called adverse cosmetic assessment. Now, this doesn't mean it was terrible toxicity. It just meant that it deteriorated more than um, the, the adverse cosmesis deteriorated uh, more in the partial breast than in the whole breast. So it was 18% uh, uh, in the whole breast versus 31% in the partial breast. <clears throat> and that was by the nurses. The patients were very similar in their assessment and the uh, doctor panel looking at photographs were also similar. So all three of them, these independent measures, at least <clears throat> in, in the Canadian trial, showed a uh, uh, deterioration in the cosmesis uh, in partial breast, which was worse than the whole breast. Now, <clears throat> ASTRO, um, several years ago, and again, this will be updated. Uh, there's a panel that's just been formed to update the uh, partial breast. Uh, which came out in 2009, but they did come up with what they call a suitable, a cautionary and unsuitable categories. And that's kind of caught on in a sense, not that it's wrong to treat patients in a cautionary category, it just means that there's not as much data. Uh, and so, um, uh, but, but in this suitable category where that we, at that time was felt, there was reasonable, um, um, longer term body of data that says, you know, partial breast is probably okay in these people, uh, in this group of patients. And, um, uh, and even though we don't have outcomes of randomized trials, it's probably safe to, to uh, proceed with partial breast if, if you choose to do that. And um, <clears throat> most of you are familiar with those. Basically, over age 60, T1, um, N0, negative margin, uh, node negative type patients, estrogen positive. Uh, the <clears throat> the um, cautionary group were those which that may have been all right. There was some data, but there wasn't as much data. And so the, the idea here is that ideally these patients should go on trial. And, um, but if you were to treat them, you should you know, discuss with them that there's not as much data. And so there's un uncertainties. And then there's what they call unsuitable, where you just thought that there was not enough data to proceed. So this will be revisited this year, and uh, it's likely some of these patients in the cautionary or unsuitable group may move over. I'm not sure what that panel will, will uh, you know, how that'll move, uh, but there'll be new recommendations on partial breast. And this will probably also incorporate some of the intraoperative uh, uh, issues where uh, that wasn't commented on so much in that first, um, now, future directions in, in, uh, in uh, 
partial breast. Um, there's lots of different things you could do, and I'll talk a little bit about intraoperative. Um, but um, so, so the target trial is, is one uh, way where a, a single um, um, orthovoltage source is, is uh, placed in the, uh, in the, in the cavity uh, at the time of the operation, or with the Elliott technique where a single dose of electron beam is um, administered to the uh, tumor bed. Uh, and both of those are, are emerging techniques. Uh, the target um, approach delivers five gray at one centimeter distance. Um, it, it's, a, it's a 50 kV source, uh, and uh, it's uh, with respect to the actual dose, five gray in one shot is a relatively low dose to sterilize subclinical microscopic disease. Um, there's some thought that maybe there are other things going on. Does the, does the um, radiation alter the microenvironment and that uh, impact on the, uh, on the microscopic disease control in addition to the, to the effect of the radiation itself? There's a lot of hypothesis, but one would not think that five gray at one centimeter would is enough to sterilize the disease in a single dose of radiation. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there was an update of the target trial uh, that was just uh, published in uh, Lancet Oncology. Um, again, uh, the, th the five-year ipsilateral breast recurrence rate was superior in the whole breast versus the uh, intraoperative, but it, they were still low in both arms. Very favorable group of patients here, obviously, and uh, so there's still a lot of debate on this trial. Um, whether in fact um, uh, the, this, the patient group was selected so well and other issues. But I think uh, the bottom line is whole breast is still better than partial breast in this particular setting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we don't know many, whether many of these patients needed no breast irradiation, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The up, this is the update of the target trial where you can see the local recurrence rate is in fact um, a little higher uh, but still very low and acceptable in both arms. Now, the Elliott trial, which is the intraoperative electron, um, was also a randomized trial, and this was uh, published. Uh, the the five-year local recurrence rate, <clears throat> again, superior with whole breast radiation compared to the uh, intraoperative, um, but again, both pretty acceptable at 4.4% and 0.4%. So obviously another very low risk group of patients. The fat necrosis rate was 14% in that arm, which is, which is high uh, when one compares it to, say, the five-day accelerated partial breast. Um, <clears throat> and they do note that um, only 23% of those patients were deemed suitable by the ASTRO criteria. criteria. So <clears throat> this is interesting. We'll continue to see follow-up, but we are seeing some divergence in higher local recurrence rates, but they still might be quite acceptable. Um, <clears throat> one of my uh, colleagues at, at my institution, um, along with uh, Frank Ficini and Doug Arthur, have been leading a trial on, uh, on an alternate approach, um, and um, this involves a, a two-day course of partial breast using... Um, using a um, uh, intric uh, balloon-based uh, technique. It kind of uh, is uh, thought to, um, I guess, appeal to both sides of the idea of, of intraoperative as well as, as uh, more conventional partial breast in that it's done very quickly, uh, but one does has the information at hand in terms of the margin, so it's done really postoperatively. So one already knows the margins, the nodal status, so one can feel forward going, uh, feel comfortable going forward with the technique. But <clears throat> uh, it gets it over with in two days, and so uh, they've um, uh, developed this trial, uh, and it's um, called the overnight study. Uh, they're low risk patients, uh, two days. Uh, there's the criteria age over 50, unifocal, less than three centimeters. Um, it's a balloon-based technique, uh, but it's multi-lumen catheter, so you can sculpt the dose. Um, <clears throat> there were th three cohorts of patients, and the three cohorts of patients, it would be 30 in each arm. Um, and um, there were predetermined stopping rules. So far, we have not had to stop the, 
trial, and the arms is seven gray times four in two days. Uh, so seven gray twice a day times four. And then the second arm was 8.25 gray twice on the first day, once on the second day, and then the third one is 10.5 gray times two. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of criteria for, for make, make, putting the patients on. Once in a while, if you can't meet those criteria, you have to either pull the balloon or convert it to a five-day treatment if you could meet those specifications. And, um, and uh, the, um, the, so far, uh, we've uh, completed accrual on the first 30 at seven gray times four. We completed accrual on the second 30 of, of uh, 8.25 times three, watched those patients for several months, and now we're on the last, um, the last cohort is, is ongoing. So <clears> that this brings up, well, we've done all these things, hypofractionated whole breasts, hy hypofractionated partial breasts. Can we uh, move to elimination of radiation? altogether. And uh, there's no question that all of the randomized trials show a benefit to radiation in reducing local relapse. Um, in some higher risk patients, this benefit does translate to improvement in survival. And I think, you know, we often make the argument, we don't want to change it. We don't want to, we don't compromise survival in these patients. So why do we want to eliminate radiation? However, I think it's quite clear that there are some patients who are at so low risk of local recurrence that we're really not going to impact on on um, survival. And this is the subject of several trials, both developing on and ongoing. Um, but again, going back to the Darby paper, showing, well, we not only impact on local control, but we impact on survival. So how could we possibly eliminate radiation uh, if we might in, uh, um, compromise a patient's survival? Well, I think uh, this slide here kind of shows you that we really will not compromise survival. This is from the Darby, pa Darby paper. And what they're showing you is that in this group of patients where you have high risks of local recurrence, and you, um, that, that, and this is like the risk of, of um, on mortality benefit versus the local recurrence. When you have high risks of local recurrence, you do impact on mortality, and there's no question about that. So if you have a patient who has a 20% risk of re local recurrence uh, without radiation, and you can lower that, you're gonna impact their mortality likely. But when you get down here to these low risk patients, you're not gonna impact mortality. So it's safe to do trials. Now that's not to say we won't improve on local control. And it's not to say that, and the standard is still to radiate these patients with invasive breast cancer. I think that remains the standard of care. But it does beg the question, can we eliminate radiation? And I think we can feel comfortable that we're not gonna impact on their, on their survival by eliminating radiation, as long as it's done in a well-controlled environment. But, um, but let's look at what patients have that low risk of, 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 uh, of uh, recurrence, and can we, in fact, um, eliminate radiation? And so <clears throat> there's a couple of trials. Now, this um, study by Anthony Files is interesting. Um, I'll tell you the history of this. This was presented at ASCO Breast a couple of years ago now, and is actually going to be in the JCO uh, in the next month or so. But <clears throat> the original uh, files trial, as you may recall, was radiation versus no radiation um, and, and uh, for the kind of elderly patients. Uh, uh, in Canada, the elderly patients were over age 50, which was like scary to me, but, um, but in any event, the, the, um, the, the, the original trial was, you know, showed that radiation reduced the risk of local recurrence in this group, but, but that it was maybe acceptable. What, what they did here is they try to pull those blocks uh, of those patients that were in those trials and do um, you know, more sophisticated um, uh, molecular markers and staining and essentially uh, defined a group that they call luminal A, which is ERPR positive, HER2 new negative, with a low key 67, and really showed that um, in the group that was randomized to tem tamoxifen and radiation, um, that if they were truly luminal A, maybe radiation didn't help them so much. And you could see here that, um, that in fact, the, uh, 
the, uh, this is a group that was randomized to radiation versus no radiation in, that, in what they did original training set and a validation set from that same trial, of course, so it's an internal validation. But, but they're not seeing a real benefit to radiation in these luminal A patients. On the other hand, in the luminal B and the HER2 news, they are seeing a huge benefit to radiation. So it may be that these luminal A patients, which is a lot of patients we treat, we can observe. So this is a hypothesis generating study, and it has um, inspired them to, to move on with a, with a phase one trial, uh, of, I should say phase one trial, a, 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 pilot, a study of uh, observation alone uh, in a single arm trial. Uh, the prime two is another uh, randomized trial, uh, 1,326 patients randomized to whole breast uh, to wide local excision uh, with or without radiation. Uh, again, uh, this was uh, published at Lancet Oncology, and uh, one sees here that um, radiation, as it does with most low-risk disease, does improve uh, local control significantly, but it's acceptable. And when they did a more or less a subset analysis, if you will, and patients, now remember these were all ER positive patients, but that when they took the patients who were um, what they called a strongly ER, high ER component, meaning a, a ER positive uh, greater than seven, uh, greater than 20, uh, or strong staining, um, the, those with high ER, yeah, there was still a benefit, but it wasn't, wasn't as much uh, the, without radiation, it was only it was only a 3.3 percent local recurrence rate uh, versus 1.2 percent with radiation. And uh, in those patients who had low ER, in other words, they weren't as strongly ER positive, they had about a 10 percent local recurrence rate without radiation. So this has has really um, you know kind of raises some questions: is is this group of patients who are you know these luminal A types, low uh, low uh, high ER her 2 new negative, maybe low key 67, whatever uh, parameter you use uh, to define a low risk group of patients that maybe observation is okay. Um, and so uh, they concluded that emission of radiation is um, uh, feasible. Uh, radiation does reduce the local risk in all subgroups, but that absolute reduction um, is um, small. So there are ongoing planned studies. Uh, um, one study that our, my institution is participating in is one started by Reshmer Jaxi, which has a, a single arm uh, with luminal A and low, low oncotype, and they'll just be observed. Uh, the files, uh, again, uh, is doing a perspective single arm of observation in luminal A, low key 67. Uh, I'm not sure where Jennifer Bellin's uh, study stands, but uh, she had, was talking about a, an observation in the luminal A favorable PAM 50. So these are all kind of uh, things that are in progress. Uh, so, um, so I think, you know, what I think we can say in summary, and we're well ahead of time so we can take any questions, is that both hypofractionated whole breast radiation as well as partial breast radiation are clearly emerging as an acceptable standard of care. Uh, patient selection is key to the success of both of those alternatives. Uh, there are ongoing trials in, high, in partial breast and hypofractionated breast that are addressing multiple issues in patient selection, technique, toxicity, efficacy. Can you give a boost sequentially, with, uh, simultaneously? All, all, there are still many questions to answer, and certainly we encourage enrollment in any trial addressing any reasonable question. But, but. There's enough data out there in both hypofractionated whole breast and partial breast that they're certainly acceptable in, in selected patients. Um, enrollment of selected low-risk patients, such as those with luminal A, low oncotype, low K67, into observation or prospective single-arm trials is encouraged. There was a proposed trial uh, came up through a number of the cooperative groups for uh, taking, uh, doing a randomization in patients with low risk luminal A type uh, disease and randomizing them to partial, to, to radiation versus not. Um, unfortunately, a current funding environment did not uh, allow such a, such a uh, trial to go forward. Uh, but, but um, you know, we do have the, the prime two study and 
and others. So, um, so there's certainly a lot of emerging data that elimination of radiation is acceptable, but what I would say is, at least for those patients with invasive breast cancer, for the majority of them, that some form of radiation is the standard of care, uh, whether it's hypofractionated whole breast or a partial breast or standard whole breast, um, and that uh, we really need to encourage um, for enrollment in these trials to sort out which group of patients is it reasonable to eliminate radiation in. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, Bruce, uh, in your presentation, when you talked about the no radiation experience, you didn't mention the CALGB uh, published data. Right, right. And is that just an omission that just happened, or is it you don't like that study, or what? No, 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 no I think that's, that's a very reasonable study. Uh, you know, the, um, the CALGB study, of course, was no, no radiation versus radiation in uh, women over age 70. The file study was also very similar to that, although they had different age criteria. Um, and, and for patients over age 70, I think it is a very acceptable standard of care to offer them observation based on the CALGB study. And, and we oftentimes have that. I think what we tend to do, um, you know, of course we don't, as radiation oncologists, we don't always see all of these patients. So we see the ones that we that tend to be in a better physiological state and and uh, are at least interested in radiation. Um, uh, you know, I think we have the discussion of of um, of elimination of radiation. Uh, we see a somewhat biased population because they're coming to see us for our opinion, and we think that they're already geared up to have radiation. So it's uh, sometimes a I don't know, you know, whether they come to us expecting to be treated or not treated, uh, but we we do have that discussion. Uh, but in patients who have a, um, let's say, a good physiological status, a 72-year-old with a long life expectancy, my tendency, um, probably in the tone of my conversation, is that I would lean in the direction of treating them, probably with a hypofractionated whole breast. A full course of radiation, um, assuming that that 72-year-old is likely to live 20 years to be 92. Um, you know, on the other hand, um, it, and I suspect we don't see a lot of these other patients who who are, are have multiple comorbid uh, illnesses and and have just have the uh, um, uh, lumpectomy. Uh, but if we do see those patients, we would certainly encourage patients with a less of a life expectancy to to be uh, observed. But I would say it's okay to observe any patient based on those trials. Um, and uh, and we do that routinely, provided they fit the criteria, which is ERPR positive um, and, um, and uh, clinically at least no negative. And, um, and are likely to go on hormonal therapy. Although one could have the argument, which is which is a more morbid treatment, the hormonal therapy for five years or radiation or whatever. So occasionally we do see patients who are ER positive, fit the criteria for CALGB, but have refused or decided whatever that they're not going to go on hormonal therapy, and we may be more inclined to treat them. Yeah. Um, I was curious, when you treat patients with a hypofractionated regimen and you choose to boost them, what uh, regimen do you use for that? Because in the STAR trials, it was all conventional boosts. Right, right. Uh, so so um, I personally do 250 times four to keep it in four weeks uh, if I did the Canadian uh, regimen. Um, I think you can go either way. I, I, I believe in Canada, um, a lot of them in, in one of the provinces does the 250 times four. The other one maybe do the 200 times five, but, but I do 250 times four. I feel comfortable with that. Um, and, um, and that's what I know a lot of the folks in Canada are doing if they want to boost, so. So uh, I'm from Canada, so I use 250 times four. Um, my question is, I had a recent um, dinner with radiation oncologists from France, and they said for elderly patients who can't come in often, they use a 6.5 gray fraction, weekly fractionation, times five, six weeks. 
Um, and they see they have limited data for coming from France and from Italy supporting that for toxicity and local control. Do you have any... I'm sorry, I, I missed a little bit of that. What was so, the... So they use 6.5 grays weekly, uh, weekly 6.5 grays times five or six weeks. Oh, okay, okay. Like fast trial. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a fast trial. Right, right, right. So, so do you have any uh, opinion on that or...? It, you know, um, the, I think there are lots of creative ways of doing this, and, and, and certainly it doesn't surprise me that, that there are, that, you know, some of these fractions, I don't have any experience with that um, personally, so I, I, I don't know, and, I, and there's certainly not a lot of randomized data in that domain. There's actually two randomized trials that I've looked at, the FAST trial, right. it was uh, the toxicity data was reported um, out of um, the, radio, the Green Journal about two years ago. It's out of the UK, and it was a 5.6 gray times 30 gray over a single fraction. Um, there was no increase in the local recurrence rate was low, but their toxicity was a little higher, and they were dropping their dose. There's also a prospective trial out of Kentucky, um, Anthony Dragon's trial, right. what he right. really did, which I think is clever to reduce um, people have uh, to reduce disparities, um, you know, people have access. Um, and I don't think that he's, he's reported some early data on it. But um, there, so there is some, some data on it, but so far my understanding is in that 5.6 spray of the 6, um, they did have excess um, uh, toxicity. So maybe um, uh, keep you know, Google FAST trial um, from the UK and you'll see those results. Well, we're actually the group in Louisville that's doing that trial, and the cosmesis rates are equivalent. And I recently wrote a review article on it. Um, but our results that I believe it's four years, three or four years, are equivalent with regards to cosmesis. Yeah, small trial, yeah. Yes, yes, it's a smaller trial, yeah. But it is pretty exciting, yeah. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first question is uh, for Canadian hypofractionation. Um, are you offering that for DCIS, um, yeah. even though they weren't on that trial? Right. So and the second question is, um, for DCIS with conventional, are you boosting the tumor bed? Sure. Uh, so the, there, there are data, again, not randomized data, but there are data that have emerged out of, out of uh, large databases in Canada uh, showing that DCIS is a, can be appropriately treated with hypofractionation. Um, I feel comfortable with it. Some don't. But, but I personally do, uh, and um, you know, I think the, the question on hypofractionation, um, I, I guess you know, one could theoretically say maybe local control, but really the, really qu the real question on hypofractionation was more the, the toxicity and the cosmetic result, and there's no reason why that would be any different with DCIS than invasive cancer. Uh, and, and there's data, again, retrospective, from, but from data uh, large database studies in Canada where they have been doing this um, that that uh, show good um, local control rates. So I feel comfortable, but some don't, and that's perfectly okay. Um, the other question was, do I boost TCIS? Um, and um, and again, uh, there's variability. You look at the randomized trials, they really didn't boost DCIS. Uh, and so I, I tend to boost it, and, and a lot of folks in this country tend to boost it. Um, uh, not always. I mean, an elderly patient with a wide excision, widely negative margins, uh, probably there's probably no benefit, and I, and I eliminate it in some of those patients. Um, but uh, if there's any question about, you know, margin, how close was it, or or a younger patient, I tend to boost. I don't know what Julia tends to do. Uh, I don't. Yeah. Uh, so, and I would just remind you to look at RTOG 9804. So RTOG 9804 took low-risk DCIS cases, randomized them to observation versus whole breast. And the patients who had whole breast radiotherapy, and none of them were boosts, the in-breast recurrence at, at seven years is 1%. So I don't know how much a boost would improve on that, quite frankly. Yeah. So. I mean, I think that in the nuclear grade three DCIS, I will boost um, uh, women, young women who, who are high grade, people who you think have an in-breast recurrence pattern analogous to invasive cancer, I would, but for the vast majority, anybody who fit our 9804 criteria, our, our results were so great, just 50 gray or the equivalent of, I think, the yeah. type of fraction right. equivalent. I 
would have to ask myself, um, what am I adding? And you know the one thing when you add boost, it, it does affect tax. It does affect taxes. One uh, last question. Uh, um, Dr. Hafty, that was a great talk. Thanks. What do you think about um, hypofractionated radiotherapy to the chest wall um, in regional lymphatics? I, I know that there are multiple institutions actually looking at this in, 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 in perspective trials, but in, in my mind, I, I wonder if it's safe. wonder what you think about that. Right. So, so it's really a comfort level, and I think most of us in, in the continental United States probably don't feel terribly comfortable treating the regional lymphatics with hypofractionation. How, having said that, have I ever done it? Yes, I've done it. Um, do, do, <laughs> do I feel comfortable with it? I personally feel comfortable with it. Well, I shouldn't say I feel comfortable with it. I'm, I'm willing to do it. Um, I, I think we don't feel comfortable with it because we don't have a large body of data. Now, there, the UK START trial did treat, I think it was 7 or 8 percent or some, some n number of their patients who did have regional lymphatic and, uh, a treatment. And if you lived in the UK and you needed post-mastectomy chest wall radiation to the uh, and regional lymphatics, I believe you would get 40 gray and 15 fractions. That's, that's the current standard of care. So is, is it safe? Yes, assuming that, you know, uh, um, you know, you know that our, our colleagues in the UK are, are not doing the wrong thing, which I think they are, they are doing the absolute right thing. Um, and uh, we have a trial at our institution where we, we did a hypofractionated uh, post-mastectomy to the regional nodes. There's a trial currently bubbling up through, we'll see if it happens or not, um, a hypofractionated versus standard in the post-mastectomy setting. Uh, and so I think that 10 years from now, we will feel comfortable uh, as the data matures and as more and more data gets out there. Um, but for now, um, I, you know, I, I think that folks should probably, in general practice, stick to conventional treatment um, unless they feel comfortable with it. But, but uh, you know, my, my reflex reaction when I see a patient who needs regional nodal radiation, even though I feel comfortable with hypofractionated, I still do standard because I guess I feel more comfortable with standard. Do you treat anybody still with conventional fractionation post well, I have the discussion with them, and, and as I said earlier, I mean, I have two patients that are I, absolutely identical in their in their uh, 45 years old, and after the discussion, one chose hypofractionated and one chose standard. Um, that, you know, and only to, I mean, a lot of times they're saying, "Well, what do you want to do, doc?" And I'll, I'll say, "Well, whatever." Um, but I feel comfortable. I, I guess the very young patients we tend not to still, but. Um, I think one of the things that's hard for me is, I, like, I've been practicing so long and I have such great results, but then people, if there's any question, I think it's my own learning curve. Right, right, I right. Have to feel, right. I don't have that outcome data. Right. And, you know, you said, occasionally see a patient who has, uh, you know, some variant of rheumatoid arthritis or uh, collagen vascular disease that you say, well, maybe I should go, you know, more gently or whatever, so, yes. We have time for one more question. I just want to make a comment. Uh, do you hear me? So I just want to make a comment. We say no good data for hypofractionation in the mastectomy setting. And you mentioned the UK data, and we say no robust data. But when we look at the prospective randomized trials for post-mastectomy patients, we have a British Columbia trial by Joseph Ragas, which was published years ago. And what regimen was utilizing that trial was a hypofractionation. In Danish, it was 50 grain 2. And in Joseph Raga's trial, British Columbia was 38 point something, and the dose was 2.4. So we do have good data for hypofractionation in post mastectomy setting and to radiate the lymph nodes as well. Right, right. Yeah, and I didn't mean to say that we have no data. We do have data. Clearly, we have the UK data, right. the British Columbia data. There's data out there. It's, it's, um, um, it's just not, uh, you know, there's not as much of it. And so... And so yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a comfort level. And, you know, personally, I do feel comfortable. You know, I've looked at, at the... Uh, uh, 
at all of these trials and, and, and mostly based on the UK data as well as the calculations from the UK theoretically that show that we shouldn't have increased risks of complications with it. So I feel comfortable with it, but, but I think it's going to take more data for um, our, um, you know, for it to percolate through the community and become an, an acceptable standard of care. And even with whole breasts, which the data is quite clear, um, you know, we saw the, uh, the papers recently that the penetrance uh, was still, even in the group that was what do they call it, San, you know, uh, uh, hypofractionated sanctioned, it was only about 38% or whatever it was, um, uh, penetrance. So it'll take a while, but, uh, and for the regional nodal, I think it'll take a long while.